Witness Theater is made possible through a unique partnership between Self-Help Community Services and the UJA Federation of New York. And this year has also received generous support from the Claims Conference, Carol and Carl Hess, the Eugene M. Lang Foundation, Shoshana Katoff, the Mani Dani Fund, the Miriam and Arthur Diamond Charitable Trusts, and Heidi and Richard Rieger. Here at Flatbush, Witness Theater is further supported through a Better Together grant from Legacy Heritage and a contribution to the program was made by Vivian and Sam Hidaya in memory of Adele Sultan Aleha Shalom. This week is her first year anniversary of her passing. Yeshiva Flappish is proud to serve as the program host for the Witness Theater program, which brings together 16 of very special students in our yeshiva and four incredible Holocaust survivors. The survivors' diverse experience during the war and their lives today will be shared on stage tonight. The unique and essential program started in Israel by JDC Eshel was brought to New York 10 years ago by Self Help, the largest provider of services to survivors in North America and partner agency of UJA Federation. It was piloted here at Flatbush, Avi, and we have remained strong and active partners. People are often surprised to learn that there are approximately 30,000 Holocaust survivors living in New York. Sadly, 50% are living in poverty, many are alone, and many are suffering with chronic illness and depression. While the total population of survivors is declining, the cost of their care is escalating as their needs become more complex. That is why in 2004, UJA Federation created the Community Initiative for Holocaust Survivors, known as CIHS, to raise funds to provide survivors with compassionate care to address their unique needs. Today, we are caring for survivors in New York, in Israel, around the world, and also in Ukraine. Projections indicate that the number of survivors who will receive and require help is increasing. Intensity will not abate significantly until after 2025. That is why we seek to raise multi-year gifts to CIHS so we can be confident in our ability to provide survivors with the stability of care that is critical at their stage in their life. A significant portion of CIHS funding is granted to self-help community services. Self-help's compassionate professionals often serve as survivors' last living relatives. By offering specialized culturally sensitive care throughout the New York metropolitan area, self-help ensures that survivors can live out their years with meaning, dignity, and the warm embrace of community. <clears throat> By you being here this evening, you are now part of that community. And I encourage you to find out about the many different ways that you can continue to be involved. Because caring for survivors is not just the work of one day a year, it's something that we must do every day until the very last survivor turns to us for help. We're going to begin this evening with a reading from Yecheskel by our head of school, Rosh Shiva, Rabbi Joseph Beyer. Thank you, Rabbi Besser. Yechezkel's Dry Bones Prophecy is an inspirational message which powerfully encapsulates the enduring Jewish belief that out of the greatest despair comes hope and the strength of optimism. Hayata alai yad Adonai, vayotsiyeni beruach Adonai, vayinicheni betocha beg'ah, vehi mele'ah atzamot, ve'evirani alehem saviv saviv, vehine rabot ma'od al pneha beg'ah, Elohim <laughs> Ba'aleti alechem basar, ve'karamti alechem or, ve'natati bachem ruach, ve'chiyitem, v'idatem, ki ani Adonai. Ve'libeti kasher tzuveti, ve'hikol ki hinaveh, ve'hine ra'ash, ve'tikrevu atzamot etzem el atzmo, 
וראיתי והנה עליהם גידים ובשר עלה ויקרם עליהם אור מלמעלה ורוח אין בהם. ויאמר אלי הנבא אל הרוח הנבא בן אדם ואמרת אל הרוח כה אמר אדוני אלוהים מארבע רוחות בואי הרוח ובכי בהרוגים האלה ויחיו והנבאתי כאשר ציווני ותבוא בהם הרוח ויחיו ויעמדו על רגליהם חיל גדול מאוד מאוד. ויאמר אלי, בן אדם, העצמות האלה כל בית ישראל המה. הנה אומרים, יבשו עצמותינו ועבדה תקוותנו, נגזרנו, נגזרנו לנו. לכן הנבא ואמרת להם, כה אמר אדוני אלוהים, הנה אני פותח את קברותיכם והעליתי אתכם לקברותיכם עמי והבאתי אתכם אל אדמת ישראל וידעתם כי אני אדוני ופתחי את קברותיכם ופעלותי אתכם לקברותיכם עמי ונתתי רוחי בכם וחייתם והנחתי אתכם על אדמתכם וידעתם כי אני אדוני דיברתי ועשיתי נאום אדוני We could not describe the impact that what this theater program has had on our yeshiva for the past few years. Just to give you an idea for those who know our program, survivors with this theater participants join us at seminars. They dance with us, they speak with us. This year alone, thank God, past the pandemic, we've had some of the survivors who are here tonight join us for three seminars out of four. All the children are impacted, but the 16 seniors who are involved today are just beyond. We're very proud of them. You'll see the interaction. And they really, really deserve a tremendous amount of Yasher Koach. But the person who puts it all together, who has always put it all together, who is so talented, who's creative, but most of all, is totally dedicated and devoted to this program from the bottom of her heart, is Sally Grazi Shatzis. Please give her. Before I begin, I just want to say that we have, we have 15 amazing students and four incredible Holocaust survivors who you will see on stage. Zahaba Unger has a, a little bit of laryngitis tonight, so her daughter, Goldie, will be bringing voice to her words. She will be out there with her. After two years of virtual witness theater programs, the magic of youth and elderly being with each other in the room this year did not diminish in all the nine months that we were together. We drank in the moments of closeness and the freedom to hug and hold hands and sit on the edge of our seats and listen with our total bodies and comfort each other in difficult moments. We fixated on each other's eyes, dove headfirst into stories of the past, and sat hand in hand, experiencing emotions on all ends of the spectrum. In spite of, or perhaps, perhaps because of the pandemic, this year's group experienced energy and connection that was more electrifying than ever. It happened on one Tuesday night at our usual time in our usual room right across the hall as we began to turn the corner from hearing stories of wartime to hearing stories of liberation. Naively, our students thought they would feel a sense of relief and happiness. They thought about freedom and they imagined smiles and hope. But upon further exploration, it became clear that underneath this particular liberation was confusion, guilt, and fear, among many other difficult emotions. And in that moment, on that Tuesday evening, they realized that nothing, not even freedom, could be understood in their own eyes. That to achieve even a tiny, speck of understanding, we needed to completely lose ourselves in their stories and see things in their eyes. 
to listen intently and look deeply and open our hearts to let in every word the survivors shared with us. It was brave. It was so brave for the survivors to tell and for the students to listen, to allow themselves to sit in the vulnerability of loss and grief and to allow emotions to wash over them like tidal waves and to cling to each other for safety. And it was then that we began stepping out of our own bodies and into the stories we were hearing. A literal stepping into their shoes to see the world in their eyes. And though none of these students are actors and most have never been on stage before in their entire lives, out of these moments grew a piece of theater that so beautifully blurs the line between storyteller and witness. Although in this way we gained a stronger understanding of the Holocaust, we also discovered that the more we learned, the more we realized we hardly knew anything. And yet seeing things through each other's eyes even for a little while, gave us a new perspective in life. Hadassah, Joe, Zahava, and Reb Shmuel became regulars at our school and on our seminars, hearing often about college plans and school gossip and social events. And our teenage students began to realize what a gift each moment of each day is and that they are all capable of things greater than they had ever imagined. Ultimately, we learned that when there is willingness to truly look into someone's eyes and listen to their life's stories and wisdom, then even an 80-year age difference cannot hinder a genuine connection. And that from this connection explodes love and pride and a desire to share that person's story with the world. And so we proudly share with you tonight's stories in their eyes. In their eyes, we see passion, hesitation, love, sadness, determination, conflict, trust, fear, gratitude, guilt, hope, confidence, pride, care, regret, kindness, honesty, faith, humor, Seriousness, wisdom, death, persistence, compassion, humility, optimism, strength, desire to tell, a flood of memories. I stepped out in the dazzling bright marketplace and saw a world that had not, in fact, 
stuffed and minded, a word that was still alive, colorful, and moving. A sun that shone, children that played, women that wore lipstick, bread that was fresh. I had been certain I would find a word outside destroyed, as mine had been in the camps, but my eyes told me a different story. I saw the house, the steps, and the door. My eyes studied the scene. I knew this was my home, but my mind did not understand. That was the same home of my past. I was a different person at a different time, and my body could not bring itself to go inside. Even after all those months, I spent dreaming going back to my home. I saw the Germans lined up by the American soldiers and there for us to sleep from, to hurt. Here, an American soldier said, take my gun, shoot one of them. In my eyes, this was very confusing because my mind still could only focus on one thing. I needed food, I needed to find a piece of bread. I was blinded by the hunger, I was liberated, but I was not free. I closed my eyes and pictured their small faces, the children for whom I had become like a mother. I thought of all the sleepless nights that I dried their tears, chased away their nightmares, tended to their most sensitive needs, and I knew there was work to be done. And so we set to work writing ten of thousands of letters to be sent throughout France because in our eyes, even though the Allies had declared victory, the war would not truly be over until all the hidden Jewish children were found. Her eyes widen, and the twinkle fades into a faraway gaze. Her cheeks flush, and the lines of her cheekbones rise toward her eyes. She leans in, and her eyes pierce mine, sending emotion straight to my heart, although I cannot yet identify what they are. It takes a millisecond, but the connection is made. I am hooked into her eyes. The room falls away, and all there is is her and me, and impending story hanging in the balance between us. God was always present in my life. Even when we moved from, Slovak from Slovakia, when I was five years old, and we were the only religious children in town, which was not always easy, I was raised with a strong connection to God. Okay, I think we are ready to start walking. But mommy, it's so cold. No other way to get to shul on Shabbos, Edita. Hold hands with Feige. You'll stay a bit warmer that way. Golde! Golde, let us drive you to shul today. It's freezing. Thank you, Helena. We really appreciate it. But we're going to walk. Children, it's called Mesir's Nefesh. It means spiritual dedication. This is what we do for Hashem. This is what He wants from the Jewish people. When I tell my story to anyone, what I always come back to say is that God must have wanted me to live. It's the only answer for why I'm here today because the odds were stacked enormously against me.
We don't have a choice, Golda. We're being ordered to report to the Gestapo. What do you think they'll want from us? What will they do to us? I have no idea. But if we don't go, we must go. Yanko, please. There must be something that can be done. You know what happens to people who go to the Gestapo. <laughs> My father was brilliant and resourceful, a man of strength and dignity. I had never, ever seen him cry before, and it was an absolutely terrifying sight. If my father was crying, we knew we should be afraid. But the children are registered for the kinder transport. It leaves in just two weeks. Call that, please. You heard what the Gestapo said. If we don't leave right away, they will take us. Golda, we can't wait. We have to leave now. We moved with the entire family to the Carpathian Mountains. And a few months later, my father was taken to a labor camp. Feige, when do you think Tati will be back? Each time is different, Edita. Sometimes days, sometimes weeks. Whenever the labor camp gives him some time off. But until then, we need to make money. If Tati isn't here to work, then Lucy and I will work. Can I help you like I help Tati when he goes selling door to door? I suppose. Hand me those yellow fabrics. So many people have ordered their yellow stars for me. You could help me sew them. Watch how I make the seam on this one. We lived in the Carpathian Mountains for two years with now and then visits from my father. But by 1942, we were grateful to have a new baby brother, but worried sick that my, my father had not returned in many months. I did not know at the time, but I would never see him again. Where are we going now, Mommy? Didn't you hear what they said? They are emptying the ghetto. Do you think Lucy made it to Budapest yet? I don't know, Yuda. I really hope so. Stay close and don't let go of your things. We need to get to the train station. Where's your mother? Are you lost, Kitsela? Don't cry. Come. mother many many times and he slashed, slashed our bags so that everything we owned spilled out onto the muddy streets. Even the one loaf of bread that we had gotten miraculously from a neighbor, little did we know that soon we would lose more than we ever knew possible. Say you're 16, Adita. Say you're 16. But I'm 13, Mommy. Just say you're 16. 16. 16. Mommy! You'll see your mother on Sunday. <sighs> said we would see mommy on Sunday. But Feige, it's already Tuesday. <laughs> How can that capo eat an apple in front of us when we are starving? A Jew who tortures other Jews? It's just so cruel.
than clothes, more than sleep. All I really need is to be with you, Feige. Feige, they said there was water. water. I will just go see if I can get some, and I will be right back. Feige! Feige! Edita! Another camp. More roll calls. More selections. More death. And me? I am still alive. How? Why? I don't know. Each time I think, this is the end. Somebody pushes me out of the line, or brings me to another group, or gives me easier work or more food. Last week, I was locked in the cellar for an entire day. And when I was let out, I found that all of the girls my age were taken away. I don't know why me, or why I have been shown those rare moments of kindness. For some reason, it seems God wants me to live. As the Russian soldiers approached, we were taken to Tresenstadt, and many more people died or were killed. But somehow, at 14 years old and just 65 pounds, I remained alive until we were liberated by the Russians on May 8, 1945. And even more miraculous, I was, re I was reunited with my two aunts. And together we made our way back to our home. I stepped out in the dazzling bright marketplace and saw a world that had not, in fact, stopped when minded, a world that was still alive, colorful, and moving. A sun that shone, children that played, women that wore lipstick, bread that was fresh. I had been certain I would find a world outside destroyed, as mine had been in the camps but my eyes told me a different story. Sahaba's so stories flood over us like waterfalls, powerful, never-ending, breathtaking. Her stories after liberation are equally miraculous, terrifying, and unbelievable. We could write an entire other show just about how she finally made it to Israel and was reunited with her eldest brother. And another show about her time spent as a sergeant in the Israeli army in the 1950s. Sometimes we find ourselves trembling in silent disbelief, unable to express our emotions with language. But in those quiet moments, when there are no words, we know we could always find the stories in her eyes.
In his eyes, I see hard lines, rigid and etched deeply by a harsh past. When he leans forward and tells his story, he squints with intensity, and his eyes challenge and scrutinize his listeners, as if to say, could you possibly think of anything worse than this? Sometimes, after a burst of emotion, his body relaxes into the back of his chair, and the lines soften into a moment of disbelief that this all happened to him, and that somehow he landed here in the present, here with me, in this room, in my school, giving me his story. My fourth grade teacher asks a question, and my classmates raise their hands. The clock on the wall tells me theater begins in just a few hours, and the school bag on the floor has a sandwich that I am to share with my brother Zalman when school ends today. But what I am staring at now is the cross on the wall. In my eyes, this is normal. There is a cross on every wall of every classroom. And yet, somehow, it still feels odd to me. This is not my religion. This does not belong to my family that keeps Shabbos and Yantiv. It belongs to the boys who throw stones at me when I walk home from school. Ten more minutes of playtime, Shmiel, and then it's time to come inside. Shmiel, come inside. Mama, who are those men who just passed by? What did you see? There were three men and a driver and a jeep. Where are they going driving so fast like that? Mama, are, are those the men that ordered our shoes to be burned? Are they the ones in charge of these armbands? Are they going to make us move again? Make more rules for us while they sit in their fancy car and their fancy boots? Come, Shmiel. Come inside for dinner. There's no sense in getting so angry. There is nothing we can do about the situation. Please, God. Let this end soon. Let's go inside for dinner. The men in the Jeep were on the way to carry out what was known as the final solution. And soon after, just a few minutes from my house, right over the bridge would be built the largest factory of murder the world had ever seen. blanket I told you to take? Yes, yes, I have it. Do you have enough bread, jam? Yes, yes, of course. I took as much as I could. Shmiel, you have here to fill in? Yes, Tati. The entire community is moving. Again. To where? We don't know. They just told us we need to leave. Even though they have already made us move so many times. I'm 13 years old. Just bar mitzvah and so suddenly feeling like a grown-up. Perpetually hungry and exhausted, our family settles in a tiny apartment in Benjen. But we never really feel settled. Fear coursing through us has become as natural as the blood pumping through our veins. But my brother and sister and me, we don't talk about it. We don't ask our parents. We just lift our eyes up. We see everything.
at the needed beating by a German officer, at sub and subsequently going into hiding, I finally gave myself up when I found out that he arrested my mother's ransom. By some miracle of luck, I just missed the latest death transport, and instead I was sent to a labor camp. It was April 1943. My father had already been taken away, and this time I was being taken. I didn't get to say it. goodbye to my mother, to my brother and sister. I never saw any one of my family ever again. My eyes tell me I am in yet another camp. That I am the number burnt into my arm. That again I will be subjected to endless backbreaking work and daily roll calls. I see the other men around me. It is hard to tell if they are men or boys like me. They are wounded and thin as skeletons. And I wonder if I look just like them. But I don't think about what I see. I don't think about my family. I don't think about God. I don't think about how many years have passed or when this will end. All I can think about is how to find a piece of bread so that my body can stay alive. I am not a human anymore. I am just a body trying to survive. Answer to me from now on. For the next many months, I received my work orders from our master chief. He gave me work to be done. He helped me hide behind the pipes. I don't know why he chose me, but Schaefer was mummish like a man after me. But when the Germans started to march in us, there was nothing he could do to spare me. We march through the fields, the forests, the seasons, from one camp to the next, from roads to trains and back to roads again. People die or are killed every day all around me. The sun rises and sets and we just keep marching for days and weeks and months. We don't know how long this will go on for. We don't know where we will end up. But my eyes are numb to the horror around me. All I can see is the next piece of bread in my mind. We are halted in the darkness inside a cattle wagon. Time passes, and then the door opens, and sun spills into the car. I saw the Germans lined up by the American soldiers, and there for us to see it from, to hurt. Here, an American soldier said, take my gun, shoot one of them. In my eyes, this was very confusing, because my mind still could only focus on one thing. I needed food, I needed to find a piece of bread. I was blinded by the hunger, I was liberated, but I was not free. It took a very long time for Rafmau to come back to a state of mind that could comprehend that the war is over. He spent weeks recuperating from typhus and then years in the Feldafing DP camp. Within months of liberation, he confirmed his worst fears, that he had lost 
everyone. With no family, no friends, and no faith, he was deeply alone. But upon moving to the Farewell DP camp, he started going to yeshiva with some Hungarian boys his age. Shmiel! Don't eat it, Shmiel! It's Treif! Leave me alone! Shmiel! You don't want to eat Treif! <coughs> Come, Shmiel. We'll get you something else to eat. Who... Who am I? Where do I come from? How can I be eating this? Under this link, he watched over me until I am emigrated to America as one of the Stanleyden. Only then I started to see again. In my eyes, I could imagine a future for the first time in five years and eight months. And I start to build my life. When Rev. Shmuel speaks to us, his eyes grab our attention completely, and everything around us disappears. Rev. Shmuel was hesitant to join our group in the beginning. Speaking about the past is painful to him. But after a few weeks, he started to trust in our process. And nothing else mattered but the fact that we were looking right into his eyes. And he knew that we were listening. He enters the room with purpose, obviously about to say something important, but his eyes give him away immediately. That glint of humor that readies us for a joke and instantly warms the room. We laugh together and his eyes dance the way his body wishes it still could. He settles carefully and deliberately into his chair and mercifully allows us to launch him back into the past with us. Slowly, his playful glint becomes a sad glaze. His eyes brim red and fill with tears as he begins to give us the next part of his story. Joe, or Livy, as he is fondly known by his family, was the second of five children and had loving parents and a peaceful childhood. He always tells us that before the war, they didn't have much, but they didn't need much. But the one memory that stands out involved the first time he ever saw a soccer ball. Ivy, uncle, come see. Whoa. Where'd you get it from? From Palestine. My father bought it for me from there. It's much better than what we usually use to football. This one bounces and you can kick it much further. Can we play with it? Yes, let's start a game. Okay, me, Rachel, and Ivy versus you and Yanko. Let's go! Life, as Livy knew it, changed forever in 1944. When his family and his, and his entire community was forced to leave Raskova. Mama, how much longer will we be here? I don't know, Libby. 
I just don't know. Four families in one room? It's impossible to be like this, Mama. At least we are all together. Many families are not as lucky as we are. To still be together is a blessing. Think happier thoughts, mein Kinderlach. Think of football. Think of Pesach. Pesach? Mama, every day here feels like Yom Kippur. Conditions in the ghetto were appalling and there was a constant feeling of death and mourning. But nothing could prepare Libby. For what was to happen next? Hey, kid! You want to live? Stay with your father. See that smoke over there? That's where your mother is headed. Separated from his mother and sister, Libby clung to his father for hope and will to live. Tati, why are those men davening over there by the latrines? It's Yom Kippur, Libby. Am I to fast? No, you mustn't fast. Who knows when the next meal is coming? After a time in the labor camp, Joe ended up in the hospital. Five days later, he rejoined his father in the barracks, where they continued to brave the daily roll calls together again. I'm still registered as a patient in the hospital. Let me go there and get my portion of bread. After being evacuated, who knows when our next meal is coming? Go fast, Libby. We could be here for hours, but we could be marched out at any minute. I will, Tati. Let's go! Rouse! Libby! two sisters, my two brothers, now my father, for us all alone. As the war neared an end, young Libby, age 16, was marched with the rest of the inmates out of Matowitz. Everyone 
after weeks of marching, we were finally liberated on the road by the Americans. I wandered for weeks by myself. Where do you go when you have no home? No family? When you have nothing? 16 years old and completely alone. At least here in Feldefink, we get some food and medical treatment. I know for certain that my family is dead. I got news that my brother was shot and killed on the same day I was liberated. And yet we had made a pact that if any of us survived, we would go back home. And I feel the need to fulfill that promise. I saw the house, the steps, and the door. My eyes studied the scene. I knew this was my home, but my mind did not understand. That was the same home of my past. I was a different person at a different time, and my body could not bring itself to go inside. Even after all those months, I spent dreaming going back to my home. When Joe speaks to us, we get lost in his eyes. The pain is so raw as if it happened yesterday. But just as quickly as the tears form, Joe distracts himself with a joke, and we laugh together with relief. Joe does not want us to be sad. Like he says all the time, we've cried enough already. And yet week after week, we continue to look into his eyes as he gives us the next part of his story. We have a mutual understanding that our young eyes are Joe's windows to the future. And that is where Joe wants his story to live on. Her eyes take me in and her breath steadies as she prepares to bring forth her story into our present. She leans forward and speaks slowly, watching me write down her memories as fast as I am able. I look up into her eyes momentarily and wonder how a person can be so accomplished and so humble at the same time. In the notebook, I write down that Hadassah was brave and she stops me and gently closes her hand over mine. Cross that out, she says. It's not true. What do you mean, I answer? Of course it's true. Her lips part and her shoulders shudder with quiet laughter. Okay, she says. Cross it out anyway. I look incredulously into her eyes again and I am simply in awe. My father's name was Schneer Zalman Schneerson. He was a descendant of and named after the first Lubavitcher Rebbe. He had a long beard and a pronounced limp and wore his traditional Hasidic garb throughout the entire war. He was a staunchly principled and proud Jew, always. He believed in doing what was right despite all of the risks. 
So when he involved our family in the saving of Jewish children in France during the Holocaust, I did whatever he told me to do. Always. He inspired action and act we did. But Tati. Forget the suitcase, Hadassah. Just pretend we are on a trip. A father and his six-year-old daughter. It's a normal thing to do. But what would happen if someone tells you to open it? With you here with me, they wouldn't have any reason to. Aren't you afraid? This American money was sent here to save Jewish lives. And I am the shaliach to distribute it. I am not afraid. On the contrary, I am honored for the chance to do a mitzvah. The last few years have been a flurry of activity. We've moved from Russia to Palestine to France. My father, with his connections to organizations who sends funding from abroad, has been involved in establishing schools for the religious children who fled here from Poland and Germany. I attended a skater, the only girl learning Gemara with the boys and often leading the debates. But now that the Nazis have occupied France, my role has shifted and my skills are being put to use. My father has tasked me with, tra with transporting the children from central France to our new safe location, location in Marseille. I then take the eight hour journey back north to retrieve another group. At 13 years old, I'm hardly older than they are. But as most of them have lost their families, I comfort them as a mother would comfort her own children. I found out many decades later that my father's school and my care for these children was actually considered part of the resistance. I always imagined resistance involving guns and dynamite. But it turns out that since my actions were halting the Nazis' plans, I was in fact a member of the resistance. My father was a man who walked right into the lion's den. He established connections with French officials in high positions, people who could alert him of imminent danger. And thus it came to be that many times we were warned before a raid was coming, and my father arranged for us to be moved to safety each time. From location to location in Marseille, and now to this farming estate called Chateau de Saint-Yvon, we were like an enormous family. 15 adults and 70 children, each of us teaching each other whatever knowledge we possessed. And my father, always organizing the working, the learning, the routine of the daily life, and never faltering as our leader. The Purim play will go on as planned. You are not to say anything to the young ones who are performing. And during their performance, you will go and pack up their things. And when the show is over, you will take them to the trucks that will be waiting to transport us. Tati, I'm scared. It's okay to be scared, Hadassah. But you need to do this anyways. Don't focus on how it can go wrong. Focus on how it will get done. After 16 months at Chateau de Manoir, near the Swiss border, we followed the Italian army into Nice, thinking we could cross into Italy. But the Germans had already gained control of the area, and we knew we needed to find safety elsewhere. My father arranged for different groups at a time to be smuggled into trucks under fruits and vegetables back toward Chateau de Manoir. Eventually, 
My parents and my brother and I were the only ones left hiding in Nice. Another ocean shot I spent in hiding. Please, God, next year we should celebrate freedom. How we build a show for Tati? Isn't it too dangerous? Won't it give us away? No one will hear. I will blow as the train passes. You hear it coming? Each time our cover was blown, we had to move. We moved all the time, always just barely ahead of imminent danger. I was always leading one group or another. I was 16 years old by the time I was put in charge of the youngest group of children. They ranged in age from four to 12 years old. Purim had arrived once again. I guess we won't have a play this year like we had last year. Now that we are all in separate groups, we have no one to perform for. So what are we gonna do for Purim? We have no food and no fun. But we have a Megillah, and I've been practicing. Come children, let us listen to the story of the Jewish victory over the wicked Haman. I took care of that group for a few months, and during that time, one of the teenage groups was sent, caught and sent to their deaths at Auschwitz. It was devastating for all of us. My mother was arrested by the French militia and tortured, but she did not give up any information about my father or any of our whereabouts. I don't know how she withstood the torture, and I don't know what negotiation took place to save her. But she was released, and the groups remained hidden. And little by little, we started moving all the little children to safety to Switzerland. In the last few months of the war, it was just my brother and me with our parents in hiding. Almost all of the children had made it to Switzerland, and we just waited and waited for news of the war's end. In order that we shouldn't go crazy in hiding, I became my father's kavrusa. Somehow, he still had all of his svarim with him, and we learned day in and day out all the way through June 6th, 1944, when the Allies liberated France. I closed my eyes and pictured their small faces, the children for whom I had become like a mother. I thought of all the sleepless nights that I dried their tears, chased away their nightmares, tender to their most sensitive needs, and I knew there was work to be done. And so we set to work writing ten of thousands of letters to be sent throughout France, because in our eyes, even though the Allies had declared victory, the war would not truly be over until all the hidden Jewish children were found. when she first walked into the room. Self-educated and famous on both the Schneerson and Karlbach sides, Hadassah is no stranger to telling her story in front of an audience. But in our intimate group, we cannot take our eyes off of her. What she did during the war is a wonder to us. We can't imagine what we would have done in her position. Yet Hadassah believes we all would have done what she did. In her eyes, we students are capable of actions beyond what we dream possible. And if Hadassah says so, 
We believe her. I look back at my life in Israel, becoming a soldier in the Nat trainer in the Nach Ali unit of IDF, marrying my husband and emigrating to America with our son in 1954. Today I see my family hundred strong. They are the ultimate victory and remind me every day how blessed I am. In my eyes, the youth of today, my family, and these wonderful students, is the only way our stories will live on. I look back on many years, owning my own businesses, a butcher store, then a clothing store in Coney Island. Today, I see a beautiful life. I'm married to my wife, Blanche, for 71 years. I knew her before the war. I still love her so much. Our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are a daily reminder I'm lucky to be alive and in love. In my eyes, I feel grateful for every single day that God gives me on this earth. I look back at my time at the Flossburg Yeshiva and building my family and career in America. I kept my story to myself until I realized the world was starting to forget. Today, I still see all the pain. My past haunts me day and night, and yet in my eyes, I see that so many people know nothing. And because of this, we must never stop talking and learning about the Holocaust. I look back at a long career in Jewish education and the building of my large and beautiful family Today, I see a world in which we need to be both watchful and tolerant. We need to teach our youth that they are capable of great impact. I always tell them that in my eyes, if you are someone who puts people ahead of yourself, you are a happier person in life. What we saw with our own eyes must never, never be forgotten. This is what we came and shared week after week. This is why we came and listened week after week. And this is why we are here today. This is why we are here today. And now that you have seen the stories with your eyes, you must make sure they are remembered and we told. In our eyes, you are now the witnesses in the carriers of our stories. <laughs> <laughs>